Data science has become the most in demand field of work globally. Major organizations are hiring professionals in this field. There is a huge difference between the demand and supply of skilled data scientists. Therefore, they are among the highest paid IT professionals. That being said, I welcome you all to today's videos on the top 40 data science interview questions. Now, before we dive into the session, do not forget to hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon for regular updates. This data science interview preparation video includes the most frequently asked questions in data science job interviews. Let's start with the interview question now. So now, moving to the first question, what do you mean by the term normal distribution? Normal distribution, also known as Gaussian distribution, is a type of probability distribution that is symmetric about the mean. Here, mean, median and mode are equal. Normal distribution appears to be bell curve in a graphical form. So here, you can see this graph. This graph is symmetry and also mean, median and mode are equal. So now, let's move forward. So the next question we are having is, what is a skewed distribution? A skewed distribution takes place when one tail is longer than the other. Skewness defines the asymmetry of a distribution. Here, the data is not distributed equally on both sides of the distribution's peak. So basically, there are different types of skewed distribution. The first one is the left skewed distribution and the another one is the right skewed distribution. So in left skewed distribution, it occurs when the long tail is on the left side of the distribution. That means, here, the mean is left to the peak and also mean is less than the median and the median is less than the mode. Along with that, left skewed distribution is also known as negatively skewed distribution. Coming to the right skewed distribution, it occurs when the long tail is on the right side of the distribution. It is also called as positive skewed distribution. Here the mean is right to the peak and also mode is greater than median and median is greater than mean. Now, so let's see in the graphical form. Here you can see that this is a graph of left skewed, right? So clearly mode is greater than median and median is greater than the mean. So now let's see left and right skewed distribution in graphical form. So here you can see that it's a left skewed graph, right? Because the long tail is on the left side of distribution. Whereas if you are talking about the right skewed distribution, the long tail is on the right side of the distribution. In a left skewed, you can clearly see that mode is greater than median and median is greater than mean. Similarly, coming to the right skewed, here mean is greater than median and median is greater than mode. Now, moving ahead, the next question we are having, what is the difference between bias and variance? Coming to the bias, bias is a prediction error that is introduced in the model due to oversimplifying the machine learning algorithms. It is the difference between the predicted values and the actual values. So let's suppose you have created a machine learning model. So while creating a machine learning model, we'll get some predicted values. So basically, the difference between the actual values and the predicted values is known as the bias. Now, coming to the variance, variance occurs when the machine learning model performs well on the training data set, but not on the test data set. So now, moving to the next question, how will you handle missing values in data? So there are several ways to handle missing values in the given data. The first one is you can replace the values with mean, median and mode. For example, let's suppose if you are having any numerical column of let's say price and there are a lot of missing values, then you can replace it with the mean. Now, moving next, we are having the dropping the values. So let's suppose if you are having any column that is present in the data set and the null values are present more than 70%, then you can drop that particular column. The last is replacing with arbitrary values. So that means you can choose a random value without any reason or system. So the next question we are having is, what are the techniques used to detect outliers? So there are various techniques that are used to detect outliers. The first one is the box plot. So talking about the box plot, we know the length of the box is IQR, that is nothing but an interquartile range, right? And the minimum and maximum values are represented by the whiskers. So the whiskers are generally extended into 1.5 times of the IQR distance on either side of the box. Therefore, all the data points outside this range values are flagged as outliers. So the next technique that is used as Z-score. So Z-score is a parametric outlier detection method in a one or low dimensional feature space. This technique assumes a Gaussian distribution of the data. The outliers are the data points that are in the tails of the distribution and therefore far from the mean. The last method that we are having is interquartile range. As we know the formula of interquartile range is that it is quartile 3 minus quartile 1. Basically, it is the difference between the 
third quartile and the first quartile. So to detect the outliers using this method, we define a new range. So let's call it decision range and any data point lying outside this range is considered as outlier and is accordingly tailed with. So the next question we are having is, what is the difference between overfitting versus underfitting? As we know that overfitting and underfitting are the two key problems in machine learning that decrease the performance of machine learning models. Now coming to the overfitting, overfitting occurs when our machine learning model attempts to cover all or more than the required number of data points in the given data set. So you can see that in this graph, our machine learning model tries to cover all the data points, right? So now what happens here as a result, the model gives inaccurate values in the data set and all of these factors reduce the model efficiency and accuracy. The overfitted model has low bias and high variance. The more we train our model, the more likely it is to become overfitted. Told you, you can see in this graph, the model tries to cover all the data points. So it looks efficient, but in reality, it is not so. Because the goal of the regression model is to find the best fit line. But here, we have not got any best fit. So it will generate the prediction error. So now, let's see how we can avoid the overfitting in model. So there are some ways by which we can reduce the occurrence of overfitting in our model. The first one is the cross validation. Second, we are having training with more data. So whatever the data is there, we can train it, right? So there are some ways by which we can reduce the occurrence of overfitting in our model. So let's see some of the ways. The first one is the cross validation. We can also train with more data. Then we can remove features too. We can early stopping the training too. Along with that, we can also apply regularization as well as assembly. Now, after knowing what is overfitting, now let's see what is underfitting. So underfitting occurs when our machine learning model is unable to capture the underlying trend. So to avoid overfitting in the model, the feeding of the training data can be stopped at an early stage, causing the model to learn insufficiently from the training data. As a result, it may fail to find the best fit of the data's dominant trend. Underfitting occurs when the model is unable to learn enough from the training data, reducing accuracy and producing unreliable predictions. So let's back to the previous slide. So in underfitting, a model that is underfitted has a high bias and a low variance. For example, the following output of the linear regression model can help you understand about the underfitting. So here you can see that the model is unable to capture the data points in the plot, right? So now let's see how we can avoid underfitting in the model. So there are two ways in which we can avoid the underfitting in model. The first one is increase the model training time and the another one is the increasing the number of features. Okay guys, so the next question we are having is what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning? Supervised learning is a machine learning method that uses labeled data to train model. For example, here you can see that how a player learns in the presence of his coach. So this is an example of supervised learning. Now, there are two types of problems that can be solved using supervised learning. The first one is the classification and the another one is the regression. So let me give you the example so that you can understand, right? So let's suppose we have an image of different types of cars. The task of our supervised learning model is to identify the cars and classify them accordingly. So to identify the image in supervised learning, we will give the input data as well as the output for that, which means we will train the model by the shape, size, color of each curve. Once the training is completed, we will test the model by giving the new sets of car. The model will identify the car and predict the output using a suitable algorithm. So there are different types of supervised learning linear regression, logistic regression, random forest, decision tree, etc. So now, after understanding supervised learning, let's see what is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning seeks to extract structure and patterns from the input data. It requires no supervision like supervised learning. Instead, it discovers pattern in the data on its own. Unsupervised learning can be used for two types of problems. The first one is the clustering and the another one is the association. Here you can see that in this figure, you can see that the model will train itself and divide the groups according to the most simpler features between them. So let's take an example. So here we will not provide any supervision to the model. We will just provide the input data set to the model and allow the model to find the patterns from the data. With the help of a suitable algorithm, 
the model will train itself and divide the car into different groups according to the most similar features between them. So the next question is what is the difference between regression versus classification? So regression algorithms are used to predict the continuous value. Regression is a process of determining correlations between dependent and independent variables. For example, price, salary, etc. I will give you the example of price versus experience. So let's understand by taking some examples. So let's suppose I am having a data set which consists of one dependent variable and one independent variable. So the independent variable contains the years of experience whereas the dependent variable contains salary. So as we know that as the experience of a person is increases the salary will also increase. So this is the example of the linear regression. So there are different types of regression algorithm. Simple linear regression, multiple linear regression, polynomial regression, support vector regression, decision tree, random forest. Now talking about classification, classification algorithms are used to predict or classify discrete values. For example, male and female, true or false. Even you can take the example of male, whether the male is a spam male or not spam male, right? So let me explain you how does classification work. So let's suppose a computer program is trained on the training data set then it will categorize the data into different classes based on that training. Different types of classification algorithms are logistic regression, k nearest neighbors, support vector machine and kernel SVM. So guys let's move further and see what is confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix is a table that used to estimate the performance of a model. It tabulates the actual values and the predicted values into a 2 cross 2 matrix. So now Let's see what is true positive here. So let me give you the definition of true positive. True positive denotes all those records where the actual values are true and the predicted values are true, right? So here you can see that the actual value is 1 and the predicted value is 1 and we got here true positive. Now coming to the false negative, this denotes all of those records where the actual values are true but the predicted values are false. So you can see that this is false negative where the actual value was 1 whereas the predicted value was 0. Next we are having false positive. So in this the actual values are false but the predicted values are true. So this is our false positive where the actual value is false. So we are considering false as 0 and true as 1 right. So here we can see that the actual value was false and the predicted value was true right. So after understanding true positive, false negative and false positive, now let's see what is true negative. So this is a true negative. Here the actual values are false and the predicted values are also false. So if you see this is the true negative, here the actual value is false and the predicted value is also false. So this is how the confusion matrix works. So now coming to the 10th question, what is the use of p-value? p-value is the measure of the statistical importance of an observation. It is the probability that shows the significance of output to the data. We compute the p-value to know the test statistics of a model. Typically, it helps us choose whether we can accept or reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is less than 0.05, then reject null hypothesis or else accept null hypothesis. Moving to the next question, we will see what is a residual. So residual in a statistical or machine learning model are the differences between observed and predicted values of data. So here you can see that this is our best fit line, right? So these are the predicted values, whereas these values are the actual values. So the difference between the predicted values and the actual values is known as residual, right? So these are the residual, right? Again, this is the point that we have done the prediction, right? These are the actual values. So the difference between the actual values and the predicted values will be our residual. The next question we are having is what is dimensionality reduction? So the dimensionality reduction or dimension reduction is the transformation of data from a high dimensional space into a low dimensional space so that the low dimensional representation retains some meaningful properties of the original data. So let's take an example to understand in a simpler way. In machine learning classification problems, there are often too many factors on the basis of which the final classification is done. These factors are basically variables called features. The higher the number of features, the harder it gets to visualize the training set and then work on it. Sometimes most of the features are correlated 
and hence redundant. This is where dimensionality reduction algorithms comes into the picture. So there are various methods that is used for the dimensionality reduction. The first one is the PCA. So PCA stands for principal component analysis and the another one is the LDA that is linear discriminant analysis. So the next question is what are the steps involved in machine learning? So the first step is data collection. Basically we are defining the problem and assembling a data set. Then moving forward we are having data preparation. So basically we are preparing our data. Then we have to choose the model and drain it. Right? And after that we will evaluate our model. So while evaluating a model we will choose a measure of success also we will decide on an evaluation protocol. The next step is parameter tuning. So basically we are doing here scale up. Right? Developing a model that overfits and regularizing your model and tuning your parameters. And at last we will do the predictions. So this is the way and these are the steps that are involved in machine learning. Moving to the next question what is pruning and the decision tree. So I will give you the simpler definition here. Pruning simply reduces the size of decision tree by removing parts of the tree that do not provide power to classify instances. Here in this diagram you can see that before pruning there are lot of sections of a decision tree but after pruning so here in this figure you can see that before pruning there are lot of sections of the tree that are unnecessary right but after pruning we have removed that particular section okay so let me read the definition for you pruning in a decision tree is the process of removing the sections of the tree that are not necessary and redundant right so why do we use pruning basically so why do we do pruning in the decision tree so that our model performs better and gives a higher accuracy right what is rmse in a linear regression model rmse stands for root mean square error it is computed by taking the square root of msc msc is where mean square error right rmse measures the average magnitude of the errors and is concerned with the deviations from the actual value rmse value with zero indicates that the model has a perfect fit the lower the rmse the better the model and its predictions a higher rmse indicates that there is a large deviation from the residual to the ground truth rmse can be used with different features as it helps in figuring out if the feature is improving the model's prediction or not now coming to the question number 16 what is the use of elbow method in k means clustering so first we will understand what is elbow method elbow method is one of the most popular method to determine this optimal value of k so what is k here k means here the number of clusters as i already told you it is the most popular method for selecting k for the k means algorithm right so to do this you need to calculate the within cluster sum of squared error for different k values so here you can see that it is written as wcss which is nothing but a within cluster sum of squared error right so it described as the sum of the square of the distance between each data value and its centroid you will then choose the value of k for which the wcss error starts to become negligible so here in this graph you can see that this is a number of cluster and this is nothing but wcss right and here at this point this is your elbow so the number of clusters will be 5 so the next question that we are having is what is naive bayes So naive Bayes classifiers are a collection of classification algorithms based on Bayes theorem. It is not a single algorithm but a family of algorithms where all of them share a common principle that is every pair of features being classified is independent of each other. So basically you have to keep remember the assumption right so the assumption about each feature is that a feature should be independent and equal. So the next question is what are the disadvantages of linear model? The first disadvantage is prone to underfitting. What does it mean? It means that it is a situation that arises when a machine learning model fails to capture the data properly. So this typically occurs when the hypothesis function can't fit the data well. Next, it is sensitive to outliers. So as you know that outliers of a data set are anomalies or extreme values that deviate from other data points of the distribution. Data outliers can damage the performance. of a machine learning model drastically and can often lead to models with low accuracy next so the next thing is that you have to take the assumption of a linearity between features and the target variables so here 
you have to assume that the feature is having a linear relationship with the target variable. Moving to the 19th question, when do we use normalization and standardization? So first, we will see what is normalization. So in normalization, it is used when features are of different scales. Along with that, it is affected by outliers too. So when do we use normalization? It is useful when we don't know about the distribution. Also, it varies from minus 1 to 1 or sometimes 0 to 1. Along with that, if you want to use it, then there is a scikit-learn library that provides a transformer called min-max scalar. So you can use this transformer and you can apply normalization. Next, we are having standardization. So standardization is used when we want to ensue zero mean and unit standard deviation. Unit standard deviation means standard deviation is equal to one. Along with that, it is not bounded to a certain range like normalization. So in normalization, the scale was from minus 1 to 1 or 0 to 1, but here it is not bounded to a certain range. Next, it is much less affected by the outliers. So if you want to use standardization, then there is a library scikit-learn that provides a transformer known as standard scalar. So this is all about normalization and standardization. Next question, explain hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is the process of testing assumptions for a population parameter on a sample of data. The process involves different hypotheses and statistical proof to accept or reject the hypothesis. Here, null hypothesis denotes as H0, whereas alternate hypothesis denotes as H1. Now, after understanding what is hypothesis testing, let's see the steps involved in hypothesis testing. So the first step is stating the hypothesis. For example, you can take the example of students with height more than 5 feet have BMI more than 20. Next, collect data. And after that, we will see the evidence to fail or accept the hypothesis. Then we will test the hypothesis and according to that, we will take the decisions. So as I already told you, that let's suppose there is a student with height more than 5 feet and having BMI more than 20. So this will be your null hypothesis. So what will be your alternate hypothesis? Opposite of it. That is, students with height more than 5 feet do not have BMI more than 20. Now, according to the statistical test, will support the alternate hypothesis or null hypothesis. Right? So this is how it works. So the next question is, what is the difference between training test, validation set and a test set? So first, we will discuss about training test. It is a portion of our actual data set that is fed into the machine learning model to discover and learn patterns. So let's suppose that if you are having 100% values in the data set, so we will take 70% of the values or 60% of the values to train that data set. Next, we will see about the validation test. So the validation test is used for hyperparameter tuning. And at last, we will see what is test set. So the test set is used for the final evaluation of the best model. Moving to the next question, what are the different statistical techniques used in data science? The first one is the correlation. So it establishes and measures relationship between different variables. For example, if we are having data set, then we are having lot of features along with the dependent variables. So it will show the relationship of features with the dependent variables. So next we are having regression. It allows identifying if the evolution of one variable affects others. You can take the example of experience versus salary, right? Where one variable is affecting the other dependent variable. Next, we are having time series. It predicts future values by analyzing sequence of past values. Basically, time series is used for the forecasting. Next, we are having the sentiment analysis. It determines the attitude of specific agents or people towards an issue, often using data from social networks. So the next question we are having, what is box plot? A box and whisker plot, also known as box plot, is used to show the spread and centers of a data set. It is also used to detect outliers. It shows the dispersion of data across the mean. It summarizes the result as the minimum. So here you can see that. So this is a minimum, which means minimum value in the data set excluding the outliers. Next, we are having first quartile. So this is the first quartile, or you can also say this as a lower quartile. So it means 25% of the data lies below the first quartile, right? So here, these are the 25% of the data that lies below the first quartile. Next, we are having median. Median is nothing but the midpoint of the data set. 
half of the values lie below it and half above. So this is the median. Next we are having upper quartile that we say Q3 right. So it means 75% of the data lies below the third quartile. So here if you can see this is our upper quartile right. So 75% of the data lie below this quartile. Next we are having maximum. So it means maximum value in the data set excluding the outliers. After that we are having interquartile range. So this is our interquartile range which is nothing but the length of the box right. So it consists 50% of the data. Okay guys. Now we will see what is whisker. So whisker is nothing but the upper and the lower whisker represent scores outside the middle 50%. Right. So here you can see that we are having the lower whisker here. Upper whisker is here. So this is all about the box plot. So the next question what is SPM? So SPM stands for support vector machine. So what is the use of SPM? SPM are used for classification as well as the prediction task. Right. So let us understand about SPM. It consists of a separating plane that discriminates between the two classes of variables. And this separating plane is known as hyperplane. The goal of the SPM algorithm is to create the best line or decision boundary that can segregate n dimensional space into classes so that we can easily put the new data point in the correct category in the future. Right? SPM chooses the extreme points or vectors that help in creating the hyperplane. These extreme cases are also called as support vectors. So these are the support vectors. That's why we used to call the algorithm as support vector machine. So after understanding SPM, now let's see some of the kernels used in SPM. So the kernels that are used in SPM are polynomial kernel, Gaussian, sigmoid and hyperbolic. So moving to the 25th question, what are a z-test, chi-square test, f-test and t-test. Okay. So first let's see what is t-test. So we use t-test to compare the mean of two given samples. Also t-test assumes the normal distribution of the sample. So when we have to use t-test, when we don't know the population parameter, that is nothing but mean and standard deviation, right? In that case, we use t-test. So after knowing t-test, let's see what is z-test. So a z-score is calculated with population parameters such as population mean and population standard deviation. So in a z-test, we assume the sample is normally distributed. So what is the use of z-test? So we use this test to validate a hypothesis that states the sample belongs to the same population. So in a simple terms, when we have to use the t-test as well as the z-test. So we will use the t-test for the small sample size whereas we will use the z-test for the large sample. Coming to the chi-square test or even you can say chi-square test, it depends, right? So we use the chi-square test to compare the categorical variables. A chi-square test fits for the two independent variables used to compare two variables in a contingency table to check if the data fits. So let's see the definition here. So chi-square test is used to determine the difference observed and expected frequencies of a certain observation. Alright, so the last test we are having as f-test. So when we use f-test, so when the hypothesis of the interest are about the differences between population means. Okay guys, so the next question that we are having is what is the difference between correlation and covariance? So now, first we will discuss about the covariance. So covariance shows the extent to which the two variables are dependent on each other. Basically, higher the number, higher the dependency. Now, what is the range of covariance? It varies from minus infinity to infinity. Right? Now, moving to the third point, it is affected by a scale of a variable. So now, let's see what is correlation. So, in covariance, it indicates the direction of linear relationship between variables. Basically, it shows the extent how two variables are dependent on each other, right? But in correlation, it measures the strength of two variables considering other conditions are constant, right? The next point is the range of correlation is from minus 1 to 1. So basically here we are having the Pearson correlation whose range is varying from the minus 1 to 1, right? Along with that, it is not affected by scale unlike covariance. Next question, what is cross validation? In a simple term, cross validation is used to validate model's efficiency, right? So let me give you the formal definition of cross validation. It is a technique for validating model efficiency that involves training the model on a subset of input data and testing it on a previously unseen subset of input data. In a simple term, it is a statistical method of evaluating and comparing learning algorithms 
by dividing data into two segments one used to learn or train a model and the other used to validate the model next we are having the cross validation by k fold we can also do the cross validation with one exception and many more so this is the idea about the cross validation moving to the next question what is sampling mention some techniques used for sampling so let me give you the definition of sampling sampling is defined as the process of selecting a sample from a group of people or from any particular kind for research purposes it is one of the most important factors which decide the accuracy of a research or survey result for example if you want to take the sample that how many people are affected by covid so you will directly go into the population and out of that particular population you will take the sample about 1 or 2% so this is nothing but known as sampling right so mainly there are two types of sampling techniques the first one is the probability sampling and the another one is the non probability sampling so what is probability sampling it involves random selection which makes every element get a chance to be selected that was the example just now i have given to you so what are the different types of probability sampling so I'll repeat we will see that probability sampling has various sub types we are having the such as simple random sampling stratified sampling cluster sampling and many more now after understanding probability sampling let's see what is non probability sampling so non probability sampling follows non random selection which means the selection is done based on your ease or any other required criteria this helps to collect the data easily right so what are the sub types of non probability sampling convenience sampling quota sampling referral sampling and many more so this was the overall idea about sampling the next question what is roc curve so roc stands for receiver operating characteristic it is basically a plot between a true positive rate and a false positive rate so here you can see that we are having the graph of true positive rate and false positive rate right also it helps us to find out the right trade off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate for different probability thresholds of the predicted values so i will give you the idea about roc curve so let's suppose if the curve is closer to the upper left corner the better the model is in other words whichever curve has greater area under it that would be the better model now guys moving ahead what do you understand by random forest model so random forest model is a combination of multiple decision trees it combines multiple models together to get the final output or to be more precise it combines multiple decision trees together to get the final output so now coming to the question number 31 what do you understand about a decision tree so as we know that random forest is a combination of multiple decision tree right whereas let me discuss about the decision tree a decision tree is a supervised learning algorithm that is used for both classification and regression the same goes for the random forest also here each node denotes the test on an attribute and each edge denotes the outcome of that attribute and each leaf node holds the class labels so here if you see the diagram this is the root node and these are the leaf nodes okay and this is the edge so moving to the next question that is question number 32 what is boosting boosting is also a homogeneous weak learners model but works differently from bagging in this model learners learn sequentially and adaptively to improve model prediction of a learning algorithm so let me give you some points about the boosting boosting is an ensemble model technique that attempts to build a strong classifier from the number of weak classifier it is done by building a model by using weak models in series so what happens here firstly a model is built from a training data then the second model is built which tries to correct the errors present in the first model this procedure is continued and models are added until either the complete training data set is predicted correctly or the maximum number of models is added right so what is the uses of boosting it is used to reduce the bias as i told you here each new subset contains the components that were misclassified by previous models it is a way of connecting predictions that belong to the different types here the models are weighted by their performance along with that new models are affected by the performance of the previously developed model what is bagging bagging is also known as bootstrap aggregating so it is also a machine learning assembling algorithm which is used to design to improve the stability and accuracy of a machine learning algorithm right so what happens here in bagging it decreases the variance right 
So bagging is used to reduce the variance of a decision tree. Along with that, it attempts to tackle the overfitting issue. So here, every model receives an equal weight. All right. Unlike boosting, here every model is constructed independently. Right. So this is the overall idea about boosting and bagging. Explain univariate, bivariate, and multivariate analysis. So first we will see what is univariate analysis. So univariate analysis involves analyzing data with only one variable, or in other words, a single column or a vector of the data. This analysis allows us to understand the data and extract patterns and trends out of it. For example, analyzing the weight of a group of people. Moving next, we are having bivariate analysis. So here, it involves analyzing the data with exactly two variables, so that the data can be put into a two-column table. For example, analyzing the data that contains temperature and altitude. Okay. Also, this kind of analysis allows us to figure out the relationship between the variables. Next, we are having multivariate analysis. Multivariate analysis involves analyzing the data with more than two variables. So here, the number of columns of the data can be anything, even more than two. This kind of analysis allows us to figure out the effects of all other variables on a single variable. For example, analyzing data about house prices, which contains the information about the houses, such as locality, crime rate, area, the number of floors, etc. Next question: What is recall? Recall tells you how many times the model was able to detect a specific category. In a simpler term, out of the total positive, what percentage are predictive positive? So let me give you the definition of it. It is a metric that quantifies the number of correct positive prediction made out of all the positive predictions that could have been made. For example, here you can see that this is a formula of recall, right? So recall formula is true positive upon true positive plus false negative. So basically out of the total positive what percentage are predicted positive moving next we are having precision precision is how good the model is at predicting a specific category basically it measures the accuracy of correct positive predictions so let's see the formula so precision is equal to true positive upon true positive plus false positive as i told you basically it measures the accuracy of correct positive predictions also, the precision value lies between 0 and 1. Now, moving to the question number 37. What are the popular libraries used in data science? So, there are popular libraries that are used in data science such as TensorFlow, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, PyTorch, Scikit-learn. Let me explain you some libraries. For example, Pandas. Pandas is used for data analysis. Coming to the Matplotlib, this is a library that is used for data visualization. Whereas scikit-learn is a machine learning library. So moving to the question number 38, what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning which is essentially a neural network with three or more layers. Deep learning is an advanced version of neural networks to make the machine learn from the data. In deep learning, the neural networks comprise many hidden layers that are connected to each other and the output of the previous layer is the input of the current layer. I will give you the example of deep learning in a simple term. Deep learning teaches computers to do what comes naturally to humans. Along with that, it is a key technology behind the driverless cars, such that enabling them to recognize a stop sign, etc. So now, moving to the question number 39, what do you understand about linear regression? So when I am talking about the simple linear regression, so there is one independent variable and there is one dependent variable. For example, experience versus the salary. So let's see the points here. So linear regression helps in understanding the linear relationship between the dependent and the independent variable. So as I told you the example of experience versus salary, as you are having the experience more than three to five years, your salary will be gradually increasing. Next, linear regression is a supervised learning which helps in finding the linear relationship between two variables. So here, one is the predictor or the independent variable and the other is the response or the dependent variable. So this is the basic idea about the linear regression. So now coming to the last question, how to calculate the accuracy of a binary classification algorithm using its confusion matrix? So first of all, let me give you the definition of accuracy. So accuracy is also a metric that is used for evaluating classification models. So what is the formula of accuracy? 
Accuracy is basically the number of correct predictions upon the total number of predictions. So here, to calculate the accuracy, we need to divide the sum of the correct classified observation by the number of total observations. So when I am talking about the number of total observations, so it will include true positive, it will include true negative, it will include false positive as well as false negative. So the accuracy will be true positive plus true negative upon the total number of observations. Okay guys, that being said, I wish you good luck on your data science journey. I hope these steps will help you plan your learning schedule. That's all we have for this video. I hope this video was informative for all of you guys out there willing to take your career to new heights with data science. Thank you for being there till the end of this video. If you have liked this video, make sure to hit that thumbs up button. Also, do not forget to enable subscribe button to never miss any update from IntelliPad YouTube channel. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPad has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts.